Welcome to ETF.com University, where we demystify the world of ETFs. My name is Dave Nottig, and I'm the Managing Director here at ETF.com. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most important, if not the most important parts about ETFs, and that's the creation redemption mechanism. Now, that sounds a little heady, but everything that's good and interesting about ETFs really stems from this one core idea. So we're going to wade in and hopefully by the end, you'll understand what it is that makes ETFs do what they do. But first, we're going to start by going back to the very first mutual fund. Now, imagine that you and three of your friends want to put some money together to invest. Now, you could all go do this individually and just open a brokerage account, but instead you decide to put your money together in a pool, and that pool is called a mutual fund. So let's say you each have $10,000, you put it in that pool, you have a $40,000 pool, and to keep track, you just notionally come up with the idea that everybody's going to get 100 shares worth $100. Pretty simple. Now that you've put your money in this pool, you go out and hire somebody to manage it for you. And let's say they do a fantastic job and they manage to double the amount of money in the pool. So it goes from being a $40,000 investment to an $80,000 investment. Now you all still have 100 shares of this pool, but each share is now worth twice as much money. So each share is now worth $200. Now, the beauty of this system of keeping track of everything in shares is that now when one of you wants to leave, you can. You turn in your 100 shares to the mutual fund pool, you get back your $20,000, and the pool is now worth $60,000. Now, let's imagine Janet wants to get in. Well, she shows up with her $10,000, but the shares are now worth 200, so she only gets 50 shares back. The pool now has $70,000 and things just move on apace. This is the beauty of a mutual fund. It keeps track of everything for you, but still lets you have a common pool and get those economies of scale. Now, most of us don't go out and start a mutual fund with our friends. Instead, we buy mutual funds that already exist. And there are a couple ways to do that. One is you could go to your broker dealer and you could say, I want $10,000 worth of XYZAB. Or you could go directly to the fund company and say, I would like $10,000 worth of XYZAB. The first thing that happens is nothing because no transactions happen in a mutual fund until after the close. But at the close, the fund does a little math. They take all of the assets they have, they divide that by all of the shares that currently exist, and they come up with a net asset value, a value per share. And then they let you buy at that price. So they'll take your $10,000, they'll give you your 700 shares and change. And then tomorrow morning, they'll put that money to work going buying stocks and bonds or whatever else the mandate for that fund is. So that's how mutual funds work. ETFs work a little differently. In an ETF, you just put your order in with a broker dealer. That broker dealer then goes and gets the best price they can for you out on the street. And they hand those shares back to you, just like you were buying a stock. Now that could happen at two o'clock in the afternoon, it could happen at 11 o'clock in the morning, it could happen at the close, but regardless, you're interacting with the market. But that begs the question, if I'm buying the shares through my broker from other participants in the market, how in the world does my money ever end up with the fund company? How does it actually get invested? And that's where the creation and redemption process kicks in. ETFs introduce a new participant in this process, the authorized participant, so-called because they're the only ones authorized to make and get rid of new shares of the ETF. So how do they do that? Well, the ETF company gives them a list and says, here's all the things that we want to own. And so the authorized participant goes out to the marketplace, they buy everything on that shopping list, and they simply hand that over to the ETF company. In return, the ETF company hands back a basket of shares of the ETF. It's really that simple. The authorized participant goes out with a shopping list, buys everything they need in the basket, hands the basket to the ETF, and gets ETF shares in return. That's called a create. Now, redemption works in the opposite direction. Let's say the authorized participant has a whole bunch of shares of the ETF that they don't want anymore. Well, they just hand those shares over to the ETF company, and in return, they get back 
that same shopping list. The authorized participant gets that basket of stocks, Cisco, Microsoft, whatever it was they wanted, which they can then go sell in the open market. So if the authorized participant can do all of those things, it's reasonable to ask why they'd bother. And like most things on Wall Street, it tends to come down to profit motive. So let's imagine that the authorized participant is watching this particular ETF like a hawk all day, and they're seeing what the ETF's trading for, $25, and then they're looking at what the basket's worth, the thing they would have to go with the shopping list to buy. And as long as those things are equal, in this case $25, the authorized participant's not going to do anything. There's no opportunity for them. But imagine there's so much demand for this ETF that it trades to a premium. It tr starts trading up and up and up, and all of a sudden people are willing to pay $25.10 for that basket, which is really only worth $25. Well, the authorized participant's gonna notice that, and they make a simple transaction. They sell at that inflated price, that $25.10 price, they sell the ETF, and then simultaneously they go out and buy all the things on the shopping list, everything that's in that basket. The net result is actually quite good for the ETF because the authorized participant is now a seller of the ETF, pushing its price down, and they're a buyer of all those underlying stocks, pushing those prices up. And they'll keep buying and selling like that until they've equalized out the price. So the ETF may now be worth 2501, but that's what the basket of the stocks is worth too. So it's great for the ETF, but it's also great for the authorized participant because they were able to buy a basket of securities for $25 and then sell the ETF for $25.10. They made 10 cents on every share, knowing at the end of the day, they can just deliver that basket and get the shares that they'd already sold to the market. It works great in the other direction too. Imagine lots of people want to sell this ETF. It's, it's unfavored. It's a bad ETF for the day. Well, everybody starts dumping this ETF and it starts trading a little below fair value. Now it's trading for $24.90, even though the basket is still worth 25. So the authorized participant does the same thing they did for a creation. They just do it in reverse. They go out there and buy a whole block of those cheap shares, $24.90, and simultaneously they go sell all the underlying holdings of the ETF. The math for them works the same way. They've managed to make 10 cents on that trade. And we put buying pressure on the ETF, getting it back up closer to fair value. And we put selling pressure on those stocks, pushing them down to where the market wants to be. So again, we get equalization of the prices and the authorized participant makes a small profit. This kind of transaction is known as an in-kind transfer. There's no cash changing hands between the ETF issuer and the authorized participant, unless cash is one of the things they happen to want in the basket. Instead, we're changing up one set of securities for another. We're exchanging shares of the fund for shares of the stocks that it owns. Works that way for bonds, works that way for swaps, commodities, futures, you name it. You can have this kind of in-kind transaction. And it's the core of how ETFs work. One of the big bonuses we get from this process is tax efficiency. Because nothing has been sold, there has been no gain or loss actually booked on behalf of the fund. In fact, even better than that, when the authorized participant shows up with a redemption, the ETF gets to decide which shares of all the shares that it owns it wants to give to that authorized participant. And unsurprisingly, they choose the shares with the lowest cost basis. In other words, the shares that if they were sold would generate capital gains. Over time, this means that the ETF is very unlikely to have to pay a capital gains distribution because it's constantly pushed out those low basis shares to the authorized participant every time there's been a redemption. Let's talk about some of the great things that aren't happening here. Well, first, the ETF sponsor doesn't need to be directly involved with me as an investor at all. They don't have any responsibility to keep shareholder records or provide statements. They don't have to man a phone bank to keep track of me. They also can't charge me a sales load because there was nobody in the middle except my broker, and maybe they charged me a commission or maybe they didn't. The other thing that this creation redemption process does is it ensures that the 
issuer is always operating at scale. They're never having to worry about a $500 creation because the authorized participant can generally only create and redeem in blocks of at least 50,000 shares. The portfolio manager also doesn't need to keep any cash on hand to or to sell things that happen to be liquid if somebody shows up with a big redemption. Remember, a big redemption just means they hand over a basket of securities that look like everything in the fund, whether they're liquid or whether they're not. The other thing that in-kind redemptions can do is allow that portfolio manager to rebalance the portfolio in sync with underlying index reconstitutions. So for instance, if a stock is getting kicked out of the S&P and a new stock is coming in, well, today they could make the redemption basket have all the stock they don't want and the creation basket have all the stock they do want. When you think about it, most of the things that are great about ETFs actually come from this creation redemption process. We always talk about ETFs being low cost. Well, the creation redemption mechanism actually removes real costs from the system. It removes transaction costs, it removes shareholder servicing costs, transfer agency costs. They're actually cheaper to run. That means that usually they're cheaper for you as an investor. We talk about ETFs being tax efficient. Hopefully you can now see that this creation redemption mechanism is why ETFs are tax efficient. Creation and redemption washes potential gains away. We talk about ETFs being transparent. Well, the creation and redemption mechanism requires transparency. That authorized participant needs to know what's on the shopping list. And that shopping list, more often than not, is the whole portfolio. The authorized participant gets to see it, you get to see it too. As for liquidity, well, creation redemption attracts liquidity providers because there's an opportunity to make money here. Authorized participants are not doing this out of charity. They're doing it because they can make a decent living providing liquidity to ETF investors. As for access, the creation redemption mechanism can make a big complicated portfolio actually quite trivial because it's outsourcing the actual creation of the portfolio to the authorized participant. Hopefully, the portfolio manager never actually has to buy or sell anything. All they have to do is make sure that the list they're handing to that AP is going to generate the portfolio at the end of the day that investors are hoping for. No matter how complex it is, creation redemption makes it trivial. I hope you can see how creation redemption really is at the core of what makes ETFs great. Without the creation redemption mechanism, we couldn't have fair prices. We couldn't have this great tax efficiency. We probably wouldn't have the breadth of products that we have. Creation redemption really does underpin most of what makes ETFs great. In future videos, we're gonna talk about how to evaluate ETFs, how to trade ETFs, how to use them in your portfolios. But as a building block, understanding creation redemption is probably the best place to start. I hope you'll join us for the rest of the series. Thanks and have a great day.